Our next speaker will be JJ Hu, and JJ will talk about principles of integrated photonic sensing. Uh, JJ is an associate professor in the Department of Materials Science and Engineering here at MIT, and his research focus is on integrated photonic sensing and imaging. JJ? Okay, thank you for the kind introduction. So, uh, I don't know how, how I proceed with the slide. Oh, okay. okay, thanks. Okay, um, so in fact, I want to start my tutorial with a quote here, which reads, equipped with his five senses, man explores the universe around him and calls the adventure science. I think this is actually very relevant here because I'm quoting someone whose name was used to name one of the most powerful telescopes that greatly extends human senses, okay? And in a sense, it can be also treated as an optical sensor as well. Now, however, if you look at integrated photonic sensing, of course, the capability of these sensors is far beyond the five senses of human, okay? And what I'm listing here is just a partial list of some of the sensing mechanisms that has already been demonstrated using integrated photonic techniques. If you look at this vast diversity here, in fact, um, when Kim first talked to me about giving this half an hour tutorial, my first reaction was this is just impossible, right? It's like trying to squeeze an elephant into a fridge. It's just not, not gonna fit, right? So instead of talking for a continuous three hours and keeping you all here and skip all the lunch session, what I have decided to do is a focus on vernacular sensors or chem biosensors as an example to illustrate general principles of photonic sensing. So what are you looking at here? Specifically for a sensing target, we are most interested in the uh, chemical molecules, the small molecules that consist of only a handful of atoms, typically has a size of much smaller than one nanometer, as well as the uh, biomacro molecules. So in this case, we are most interested in proteins, such as antigen and antibodies, as well as nucleic acids, such as RNAs and DNAs. Some of the sensing principles can also be applied to larger sized particles like viruses or bacteria, okay? Okay, having defined the scope of this tutorial, now let me go on to show you the outline of my talk here. So I specifically focus on three most commonly used photonic sensing techniques, and they all share this common feature that are considered as label-free. So the idea here is these techniques, uh, when during the sensing process, you do not have to chemically modify the molecule with either fluorescent tag or a radioactive tracer, and instead, you can directly detect the presence of these molecules, okay? And hence the name, label-free. Specifically, we'll be looking at reflectometry, which means we are looking at the refractive index change induced by surface binding of the target molecules. We'll also talk about absorption spectroscopy. Here, we're looking at absorption induced by chemical molecules at a specific vibrational wavelength. We also have Raman spectroscopy that examines the normally and Raman scattering coming from the target molecular species. For each of the techniques, we'll focus on two key questions here. One is, what are the sensing elements or the components that, that comprises the sensing system? As we'll see later, despite the vast, vastly different sensing mechanism, many of the sensor systems actually share the common building blocks that can be used applied different, uh, across different sensing platforms. In addition, we'll also talk about the arguably most important sensing matrix here, the sensitivity and selectivity, and what factors determine the sensing performance. So first of all, let's look at reflectometry here. So in this block diagram, I'm actually giving you the configuration of the sensor elements here. So we start with a, a narrowly tunable, visible, or near IR wavelength laser. We perform a wavelength sweeping scan to look at a refracting index change. The sensing element has to actually be coated with some kind of functionalization layer. So it means you only selectively bind to one kind of target molecule that you're trying to detect, okay? So when the sensing element is exposed to a solution that contains the target molecules, you're gonna induce this surface binding, and the surface binding then changes the refract index that's seen by the optical mode. So if you look at what the sensing element is, there are a few, really, a few options here. You can either use a micro resonator, so a micro ring, a micro disc, or photonic crystal cavity. And in all these cases, uh, what you're looking at is actually a shift of the resonant wavelengths induced by this refracting exchange. You can also use the Marquisander interferometer, and in this case, you're exposing one of the sensing arm to the sensing media. So when you have a, a molecular attachment to the sensing arm, you induce the relative phase difference between the two interferometer arms, and that leads to in in intensity change at the output end that can be detected using optical techniques. Now, if you use the interferometer, if you have an interferometer with a very long interfering arm, arm length, they actually induce a larger phase shift and therefore it's more sensitive. So one trick people have played is actually to create this kind of spiral waveguide structures 
that allows you to create a long sensing arm while preserving the uh, real estate on the chip. Now, the last device platform here is what we call the Surface Plasma Proton or SPP waveguides. So in this specific example here, I'm showing you a nitride waveguide with part of the curling actually stripped. And then the metal layer, such as gold, is deposited on top. So this metal layer actually supports what we call the Surface Plasma Proton or SPP modes. And you can treat this pretty much just like a guided mode that's highly lo tightly localized at the surface of the gold field. So when you expose the sensor to an, uh, to an analyte, when you, have, uh, um, when you send light down this silicon nitride waveguides, at some specific wavelengths, you have the phase matching condition. That means the propagation constant of the dielectric mode actually matches that of the SPP mode. So then, if you look at the transmission spectra, at this phase matching wavelengths, you actually see a dip because you're transmitting light from the dielectric waveguide back to this SPP mode. Now, this phase matching condition, of course, also depends on the reflect index of the surrounding environment. So whenever you have molecular attachment, you see a shift of this wavelength, and that's how you actually detect the presence of the molecules. Okay, so what actually determines the selectivity of this technique here? So reflect index change is actually not specific at all, okay? Any kind of molecular binding can lead to a reflect index change. So selectivity of a ref reflect index sensor entirely depends on the surface functionalization coding here. So one good example is when you actually want to detect proteins, you usually coat the surface of sensor with some kind of conjugate antibody that will selectively bind only to the conjugate antigen. And the idea here can be actually explained using what commonly called as a lock and key mechanism. So the geometry of the antibody actually exactly matches that of the antigen. You also get these chemical functional groups that actually bind to each other only at the selective sites that exactly match each other. Okay. So with this chemical and uh, geometric complementary uh, capabilities, you actually get very specific binding reaction between antibodies and antigens. So to actually characterize this kind of selectivity, we usually use a parameter called selectivity coefficient. So what I'm showing you here are two reactions. A actually represents the uh, functional groups or the functionalization coding. B is actually the interfering agent, and C is the target molecule we're trying to detect. So from these two mining reactions here, you can get the equilibrium constant, and the ratio of these two constants gives you the selectivity coefficient. So the larger the selectivity coefficient is, the more specific this binding rea reaction is, because there's less binding reaction occurring with interfering agent. Now, for, for antibodies, you can usually get a very, very high selective coefficient. It's pretty much specific. You can apply the same idea to other kind of agents. You can use complementary strand of DNA to detect single strand DNA, okay? You can also use polymers with a high partition coefficient to detect small molecule chemicals. But in general, okay, there are some uh, exceptions. But in general, as you go to smaller molecules, you get decreased sensitivity. So what people will do instead is they have actually have to use an array of microsensors, each coated with a different coating that has different affinities to different chemicals. And then you apply essentially a pattern recognition algorithm to determine what is the concentration of different chemicals. Okay? So it's a more involved process. Now, what about sensitivity here? If you read papers looking into what is the sensitivity of these refract index sensors, you often see two very different kinds of metrics that's quoted as a limit of detection, okay? In one case, it's what I call absolute matrices. So you measure what is the smallest amount of molecules you can detect. That's measured either in mass or in the number of molecules. Alternatively, you also have what I call the normalized matrix. Essentially, you normalize the absolute metric with either sensor surface area or the volume of the sensing media. So the, um, again, which matrix is actually relevant really depends on the application scenario, okay? But if you're looking at con uh, a solution concentration that's not too low, so something above, for example, the femtomolar range, and you're looking at, uh, 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 say, biomacromolecules, in most cases, what's gonna happen is that these molecules actually form the quality continuous surface coating on the surface layer, okay? So as a result, this normalized matrix is really more relevant for most applications. Now, this is about the biological uh, performance. Now, what, come, what about the photonic device design that gives us the best field of merit in terms of device performance? So here I'm proposing a generic field of merit that's essentially the refract index sensitivity or I sensitivity normalized by the overall loss in the device, okay? So here the I sensitivity is defined essentially as the wavelength shift per unit refract index change in the sensing region, okay? So the idea here is actually pretty clear. It can be most simply illustrated from the case of resonator sensing. 
So in a resonator, if you have a high optical loss, that means you actually get a very low Q resonator with a broad spectral bandwidth. Okay, so having such a broad peak certainly decreases your wavelength resolution, the ability to resolve small wavelength shift. Okay, so as an example of application for this uh, figure of Mary here, let's look at this interesting case of comparing dielectric resonators versus surface plasmon proton waveguides. So if you look at the refracting index sensitivity of dielectric resonators, you can solve that pretty straightforwardly using classical cavity perturbation theory. Okay. So without going to the details of the double integral here, the results boils down to three factors. So gamma is actually the confinement factor in the sensing region. Delta N is the reflecting exchange. And lambda is the detection wavelength, okay? So keep in mind that the confinement factor usually is more than unity, so that actually sets the upper boundary for the reflecting index sensitivity for these dielectric cavities. And if you look at, for example, silicon at 1550 wavelength nanometer, this limits us to a reflecting index sensitivity of about 500 nanometer per IU, reflected index unit. Now, what about SPP? So like I mentioned, SPP actually works on a different mechanism. Here, the tip, or, or the transmission tip, comes in because of phase meshing mechanism, okay? So what I'm showing on the, left hand, on the right hand side figure here is actually a dispersion diagram for the uh, plasmonic mode as well as the dielectric guided mode, okay? So when there's the reflected index change, or actually this crossing point here, shows up as the uh, phase matching condition. That's where you get this uh, transmission tip. Now, if you're actually introducing your analyte, you cause a reflect index change, and then the dispersion relation is going to modify due to this index change. And therefore, this phase matching condition is also going to shift in terms of wavelengths. Now, if you, this two uh, dispersion relations has very similar slope to start with. So in other words, this two relation has a similar group index to start with, then any small change of the curve is going to lead to a large shift of this phase matching condition. So as a result, you get to this kind of gigantic eye sensitivity in SPP sensors. That usually can be above 10 to the 4 nanometer per IU. Okay? Now, what about on the other side of the equation, the loss? So for dielectric resonators, you can get pretty low loss, well below at 1 dB per centimeter. When it comes to SPP devices, this paper in Auto Express actually gives a very nice analysis that shows the, uh, the loss is actually limited by the radius of the coupling from the uh, dielectric mode to the uh, SPP mode, okay? And you also get this additional loss coming from the uh, absorbing metal. So what they conclude in this paper is that in terms of figure merit, dielectric resonators is actually advantageous compared to this uh, surface plasma resonators, okay? So again, here this analysis has not taken into account other factors like ease of surface functionalization or chemical stability of the interface, but I think it gives us a good guideline to pick what is the optimized device for the uh, biochemical sensing here. Okay, now let me switch gears and let's look at absorption spectroscopy. So in this case, what we are trying to do is to actually obtain the absorption spectrum as a function of wavelengths and use the absorption signatures to identify the specific molecules. So to do that, we actually need to use a widely tunable laser, or we can use a broadband uh, coherent wavelength source as a light source. We then send the light down on the sensing element, and then we can detect it. If you use a tunable laser, you only need to use a single element detector. If you use a coherent broadband source, what you need to get is actually a spectrometer that gives you intensity as a function of wavelength. Okay. So as an example here, I'm showing you absorption spectra of methane, quoting from Heatran database. And if you look closely into this uh, grass of moles at the uh, about three microns, you see this uh, tightly or evenly spaced uh, optical absorption lines where the wavelengths as well as intensity of this moles gives clear signature of the presence of the molecule. Now, with, infrared, with absorption spectroscopy, the question is what wavelengths should you operate these sensors at? And what I'm showing you here is essentially absorption fingerprints of most of the commonly seen chemical functional groups. The horizontal axis is actually given in terms of wave numbers. So from the left-hand side, it starts at around 2.5 microns, all the way up to about 15 or 20 microns. So that means if you want to perform this kind of detection, it's optimal to actually perform your sensor sensing at the uh, mid-IR wavelength. However, as we all know, mid-IR uh, devices are a lot more difficult to fabricate as well as characterize. So the alternative is to actually go with the near-IR overtone, which essentially corresponds to the integral multiples of the vibrational frequencies. Okay, the downside there is, of course, the, uh, the near-IR overtones is about two orders of magnitude weaker compared to the mid-IR absorption lines, and you'd actually take a hit in terms of sensitivity, okay? But actually, it works pretty nice, so for example, for uh, methane, 
the absorption line has three microns, so the overtone is at 1.5 microns, which exactly matches the telecom wavelength. Okay, so now let's take a look at the uh, components for this uh, sensor here. So for the light source, if you want to use the laser, uh, actually recently, the Zhong Bao's group at UCSP has demonstrated that they can actually integrate quantum cascade lasers directly onto silicon using hybrid bonding process, so that openness of uh, the integration from MIR sources onto the silicon chip, okay? The alternative is actually to use a broadband spatially coherent source, okay? I want to emphasize on the coherence here because if you look at the sensing element, it has to be single mode, okay? If you have a multi-mode sensing element, like a waveguide, for example, then the different pro optical, optical modes is going to have different confinement factor at the sensing region. So that means when the mode propagates through the uh, sensing de device, you actually experience different op optical absorption. You also get this multi-mode beating, which actually prevents the uh, precise quantification of the uh, molecules. So therefore, in order to efficiently couple into the single mode source, you also need to have a spatially coherent light source to start with. So in other words, if you have bright body source, it's likely not gonna work for absorption spectroscopy, okay? So fortunately, there are already several kinds of spatially coherent source available, okay, at least in the laboratory scale. There are companies offering a superluminescent diode up to about 3.5 micron wavelength. You can also use a waveguide superconinium source or frequency comb source in a, from a ring or micro disc resonator, okay? Now, what about the sensing element here? Like I said, it's pretty boring. It's kind of actually similar to what we already have for the refractometry sensing. You either use a micro resonator or you can also use a spiral waveguide to actually increase the path length and then improve the uh, detection limit. Now, I want to also say a few more words specifically about spectrometer here. So there are two major categories of spectrometer. One kind is what I call spectrum splitting or dispersive spectrometer, where you use a dispersive element to spatially separate different wavelengths of light and then use a ray detector to quantify the intensity at each wavelength, okay? Two examples here. One is actually a grating spectrometer. You use a grating as a dispersive element. You can also use the random scattering media, and then you apply kind of pattern recognition algorithm to look at a spatial signature for each wavelength, and then use a linear transformation to back out what is the uh, spectral information, okay? An alternative here is uh, what I call the time domain modulation spectrometer. And a good example here is this classical Fourier transform infrared or FTIR spectrometer. The advantage here, one, of course, is that you can actually use a single element uh, detector, which is, uh, uh, which is a lot cheaper compared to a ray detector, especially in the IR wavelength, okay? Now, if you look at what this FTIR spectrometer looks like, essentially it's an interferometer with one of arms with tunable optical path lengths. So as you move this tunable arm, you actually record intensity at the single element detector, and by applying a Fourier transform, you can then back out the spectral information, okay? As I'll talk about in just a couple of slides, this FTIR spectrometer actually has pretty important advantage in terms of signal-to-noise ratio, and that in improves the uh, detection sensitivity. So now, what determines the selectivity of this kind of absorption spectroscopy? So let me put out the conclusion here, is that the selectivity is actually dictated by the number of spectral channels, or in other words, the number of data points on your spectrum, okay? So what I'm showing you here, this is actually a pretty nice simulation result quoted from this paper that shows how the, uh, um, the detection limit in the vertical axis as well as the uh, selectivity in the, uh, represented by the false positive rate as a function of the number of spectral channels. And what is shown in the graph here is as you increase the number of spectral channels, you get a moderate improvement in terms of detection sensitivity, but you get a drastic improvement in terms of detection selectivity, okay? So this is quite in, can be quite intuitively understand because you get more data points, essentially you can do a better spectrum fitting, so you have better ability to identify your target molecules. Now, what about sensitivity? Now, when you talk about limit of detection, it's always about signal-to-noise ratio as a specific measurement bandwidth, okay? So in terms of signal, it comes to optical absorbance that can be pretty trivially calculated using lambert Beer's law. And in this graph here, I'm just showing the calculated limit of detection as function of optical path lengths. And pretty clearly, if you get a low loss device, you can have much longer path lengths, you get a lot sens more sensitive detection. Now, what about the, sens uh, uh, the uh, noise here? So, um, the in analysis is actually a little bit more involved, so I will just directly throw the conclusion out here. So, for the same measurement bandwidth, or for the same integration time, if you look at the dispersive spectrometer, the signal to noise ratio actually squares, uh, scales with a factor of square root i divided by n. So I is actually total intensity integrated over the entire spectrum, okay? 
n is the number of spectral channels or number of data points. So like I mentioned, if you want to have high selectivity, you want to get a large n, but apparently you are introducing a trade-off between selectivity and sensitivity for this kind of spectrum splitting spectrometer here. Okay. On the other hand, if you go with a laser spectroscopy or using an FTIR-like spectrometer, the SNR only depends on the square root of the light intensity. So you remove this trade-off here and you improve this uh, signal to noise ratio actually by a factor of square root n, which can be very significant for wide wavelength scan. Okay. So takeaway message here, in order to improve sensitivity, we need to have a long optical pass length to increase the light matter interactions. We also need to pay attention to the device design to avoid splitting optical signal over many channels and then decrease the signal to noise ratio. Okay, last but not least, let's talk about Raman spectroscopy here. So Raman spectroscopy uses this nonlinear Raman scattering process. You usually start with a fixed wavelength laser that's either in the UV all the way up to near IR wavelength. You send it down a sensing element, which you can now interact with target molecules and create Raman scatter signals. You then use a filter to filter out the original laser signal and then detect the Raman scattered light signal. Now, uh, if you look at this uh, vibrational spectra here, it turns out Raman also detects the molecular vibration spectra, very similar to IR, but I want to emphasize that IR and Raman are actually highly complementary techniques. Because due to the quantum mechanical, mechanical selection rule, any vibrational mode that's IR sensitive is actually Raman inactive, and vice versa, okay? So that's why in the analytical chemistry community, IR and Raman are often used in conjunction to identify the molecular species, okay? So they are very complementary. Now, if you look at this intensity of Raman scattering, it depends on a few factors here. First of all, omega r is the frequency of the Raman scattered light, okay? So intensity depends on omega r to the fourth power, so it means it's actually advantageous to go with a short wavelength extension light, such as UV light, okay? Now, there's a caveat here. If you go with short, short wavelength extension light, you may induce fluorescence in your molecule, or you may actually induce absorption in a sample. Okay, so you need to kind of strike the balance between high signal to noise ratio as well as the uh, reduced fluorescence. Now, as a nonlinear process, Raman also depends on electric field roughly to the fourth power. Okay, so that means that you can create a tightly localized optical mode. It also amplifies the Raman scattered thing. So that's why, if you look at the sensing element design, people have focused on how to concentrate light field into a very small spatial region. One such example is what we call Surface Enhanced Raman Spectroscopy, or SIRS, which people use the met essentially metallic nanostructures to create tightly confined localized surface plasmonium resonant modes and enhance the Raman interaction, okay? So you can either use a self-assembled metal metallic nanoparticles or metallic nanostructures patterned using the EBM lithography. Now, an alternative technique is to use waveguide Raman spectroscopy in this sense, you may, as you may see from the figure here, you again see this kind of universal spiral waveguide. So having a long optical path length also contributes to stronger light matter interaction and increased optical signal here. Now, what about the performance metrics for Raman spectroscopy? So for selectivity, it's actually kind of similar to IR because we are always looking at characteristic spectral signatures of the molecules. So you also want to do a spectral fitting, okay? In terms of sensitivity, there are a couple of factors here. First of all, you want to tightly combine optical modes to enhance the long linear interaction. At the same time, interaction length also matters. If you have a long waveguide, you get more Raman signal. And this is clearly shown in this equation here that I quoted from the paper in the previous page, okay? Again, I'm gonna skip the math here, but what's more important is that the entire equation is proportional to L, where L is actually a waveguide length, okay? So having a low loss waveguide allows you to accumulate more Raman signals. Now, another factor that's implicit in this equation here is this eta naught factor. It actually represents the field overlap between your optical mode and the uh, molecule, uh, location of the molecule, okay? So again, having a high index contrast system with tightly confined optical modes also contributes to a stronger Raman thing. Now, last point here I also want to make about accuracy. This is actually more, mostly specific to SIRS uh, uh, detection, okay? So, um, the, because Raman actually pretty, pretty the signal is in, uh, amplitude pretty extensively depends on the field enhancement factor. If you look at all these metallic nanostructures, uh, the field enhancement actually critically depends on the geometry dimensions. Okay, so for example, if you change the curvature at one of the corners, you can actually get a pretty large field modulation. All right, so therefore, one of the focus in the SIRS community is to actually improve the detection accuracy of these techniques. The other kind of variation comes from the variability in terms of molecular placement, okay? Because all these uh, high field spots, this what's called hot spots in the community, usually are deep sub in scale, 
So if you move the molecule right now by just a few millimeters, you change the fuel amplitude by a large uh, amount, and that actually changes your signal, okay? So therefore, in terms of quantification of different chemical species, probably wave guide Raman spectroscopy is actually a preferred approach. All right, so I'm actually having this table here that actually summarize all what I have talked about, the different matrices for the different techniques. I believe the slides is gonna be available to the audience, so I'm not, not gonna reiterate this point here. And instead, what I want to do is to conclude my talk with a few final remarks. So first of all, the takeaway message is there's no single detection techniques that can actually solve all the earth sensing needs, okay? Fortunately, despite that we have to invent all these different kinds of sensing mechanisms, a lot of these sensing components can actually be shared across the different sensing platform, okay? For example, if you look at sensing elements, you always see this kind of spiral wave, guys. You see micro resonators, okay? And if you look at the spectrometers, they can be used either for absorption spectroscopy or Raman spectroscopy, okay? What's more, all these elements can actually leverage the significant effort and knowledge base that has already been developed for telecom applications, okay? So for example, resonators, they readily derive from special filters in the co communication community. And you can also apply these components that you develop for sensing application also for other applications. So for example, resonators can be used for optical gyroscopes. You can also use the spectrometers, which is nothing different from the uh, optical channel, mo channel monitor in a WDM application, okay? Now, besides building these building blocks, you also need to pay attention to the performance matrices here. For sensitivity, it all boils now to enhancing the light matter interactions. For that, you want to have a low loss device so that you have a long optical path length. You also need to engineer a device so that you have large overlap of the optical field and the target analyte. Uh, we also talk about the design of the devices, and specifically, I want to mention about the fail gate advantage here. Yeah? That means if you have a, a spectrometer that do not split the light, you actually get enhanced signal to noise ratio. Now, in terms of selectivity, if you look at refractometry sensors here, you want to develop coatings that's highly selective. Okay, so that's a backend process that will happen after the uh, 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 CMOS fair. For ion Raman spectrometer, it all boils now to the number of spectral channels that allows you to perform more precise spectrum fitting. So in the end, I also want to emphasize that new materials and processes are actually critical to improving the sensor performance. So the lesson is actually very similar to what happens in the CMOS electro microelectronic industry. If you look at the early days of the MOS law, people are really making use only a handful of elements. Okay. But nowadays, advanced CMOS process actually incorporates more than half of the uh, periodic table. So I believe that the same thing is going to occur for microphotonics, in particular for sensing, that can bring in a lot of new functionalities, like either extending transmission range of the optical materials, or introducing materials with high nonlinearity to create spatially coherent sources, for example. Okay? So with that, I want to conclude my talk. I'll be happy to take your questions. Thank you. Questions? Uh, I have a simple question. Yeah. So what's the advantage of uh, uh, this waveguide uh, micro photonic based uh, uh, sensors comparing to the traditional fiber grating? I know that fiber grating, they also use plasmonic fiber grating to, for the yeah. sensing, so can you comment? Yeah, sure. So there are a couple of advantages here. One is actually, uh, again, like you have the swap advantage, right? Your size, weight, power, all kind of things. Um, the other thing is actually for the uh, uh, small, for if you look at waveguide sensors, in order to expose the wave fiber, sorry, for fiber, in order to expose the fiber to the uh, sensing media, you need to strip the waveguide core and create this taper region or the sensing region, okay? Their length is, can be limited to a few centimeters to tens of centimeters. Now, for a waveguide chip, you can actually create very long waveguides by essentially creating high index contrast waveguides with spiral waveguide structures that enhances light matter interaction. What's more is actually index contrast. So if you look at high index contrast waveguide like silicon, you actually get this very high fuel spike right at the surface that increases the interaction uh, or, or fuel overlap. So that's another advantage. The third advantage here is there are actually some emerging sensing techniques that capitalize on this tight optical confinement uh, to increase the sensitivity, such as you can use photoacoustic or photothermal sensing to further boost sensitivity compared to conventional photoabsorption spectroscopy. Yeah. Oh. It looks to me that <clears throat> there are two major uh, challenges. Can you comment that? One is uh, uh, you know, some of the light sources you mentioned are, are not normally commonly used for silicon photonics, right? Yeah. 
you know, how you deal with that coupling all these issues. Second thing is you mentioned about all this coding mm -hmm. to the, the material. Uh, can you give some example, any experimental showing these things can be done easily? Okay, the silicon sure. CMOS compatible silicon photonics platform? Okay, very good questions. So the first question has to do with the light source. Um, so for light source, I guess it really depends on wavelength. Okay, so if you're looking at, for example, 1550 for refracting index sensing, or look at uh, over absorption overtones of hydrocarbons, for example, you can read, just use the telecom wavelength source. That you can either you do a wafer bonding, or you can actually go to, for example, germanium laser at 1550 to perform the sensing here. Uh, if you want to extend to either UV or the IR, um, there are some efforts, like I mentioned, that people are looking into either heterogeneous integration, or you can also use nonlinear process to actually convert the frequency from the telecom wavelengths to this uh, more difficult to assess wavelength ranges. Okay? Now, in terms of the surface coatings here, um, I guess um, I'm not sure CMOS compatible is the right term, because you will apply the coating always after your CMOS process. It's kind of like a back end process, right? Um, so some examples here, if you look at like say strep and uh, uh, coatings, you can, the antibody for strep has a very high binding affinity on the order of 10 to the 15th. So it means it pretty much only binds to this specific kind of molecules. And this kind of surface functionalization scheme is actually very common in the biological community. Uh, the, the gold standard for biological detection is actually used enzyme-based immuno, immunosorbing assay link. And that technique is actually used the same kind of uh, antibodies that we're using here. Okay. For polymers, uh, there are also some good examples where you can use coating to boost the detection sensitivity. More, of, more than the detection selectivity, because like I said, small molecules are not selective, okay? So there are some work in the Naval Research Lab that develop polymer coatings with a very high partition coefficient of 10 to 7 for nerve gas molecules. So it means you can actually improve the detection sensitivity by 7 orders of magnitude, which is certainly gigantic. Okay. All right, thank you very much, Jay. Okay, thank you.